In our Bible study today, we're going to be focusing upon the subject of Bible prophecy and the one world religion. The Bible dramatically and clearly prophesies that there is coming a one world religion upon this earth. And we have lived long enough that the stage is being set for that one world religion before our very eyes. Uh, many of you that are listening may not be aware that the Bible did in fact distinctly make that prediction of a coming one world religion. And you may also not be aware of the fact that a one world religion headquarters has already been built and dedicated months ago. As a matter of fact, the One World Religion headquarters was officially inaugurated in February of 2023 to provide a global place of worship for all. And during our broadcast today, I will be showing you uh, some pictures of that impressive and lavish global temple and providing more details uh, in the moments to come. But in our Bible study today on Bible prophecy and the coming one world religion, I want to answer four questions. And for those of you that are taking notes, those four questions, and we'll take them one by one. But the four questions are, number one, where does the Bible prophesy a one world religion? If someone were to ask you, where in the Bible does it speak about a coming one world religion? Would you be able uh, to turn to the pages in the Bible, in the book of the Bible, and show them? We're going to help you with that. Number two, what will the one world religion believe? Number three, when will the one world religion emerge? And then number four, who will lead this one world religion? As always, I am sincerely grateful for all of you that are joining us today and uh, all of you that are a part of our weekly Bible study uh, that is growing in global ways. Uh, almost a million students a month that study with us and uh, we're so glad to have uh, all of our faithfuls, but all of our new students, we welcome you and we're so glad that you're a part of our Bible study. And if you enjoy learning uh, Bible prophecy and sound theology, as I often say, I would like to earn the right to be a trusted voice in your life as we navigate these perilous times that we're living in that the Bible obviously warned us about. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe. And if you hit the notification bell, that will ensure that you'll not miss any of the new content. And that will keep you uh, apprised as to what is coming next. So with that said, let's start our Bible study by beginning in Revelation chapter 13. Uh, if you're a brand new student of the Bible, Revelation is the very last book of the Bible. And the 13th chapter, Revelation chapter 13, beginning to read at verse 1 and reading down through verse 8, I often read out of the New Living Translation as I'm doing today. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 8, the Bible said, Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Now the sea uh, in Bible terms as it is interpreted refers to uh, nations and just the way um, they spoke in the original languages and the original texts being translated into English. That beast is the Antichrist rising up out of the nations. And the Bible said it had seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns on its horns and written on each head were names that blasphemed God. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. Verse 3, I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. 
the whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. Run a highlighter through the whole world. I want you to see that the Bible is clear in providing verbiage that lets us know that this is not going to be a regional or a national occurrence. It involves the entire world. Verse 4, they worship the dragon for giving the beast such power and they worship they also worshiped the beast. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed. Who is able to fight against him? Then the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God, and he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months, three and a half years, just as Daniel in the Old Testament prophesied. Verse 6, and he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all the people who belonged to this world worshipped the beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. Quite a significant prophetic passage, and we're going to come back to that in our study today. But as we always do, let's Take a moment to pray together as we enter into this Bible study. Father, once again, uh, we give you praise uh, for all things, for life and for health and for strength. Everything good in our life comes from your hand, and we humble our hearts in your holy presence and before uh, the great audience of people that you have allowed us to speak to. I pray that today you'll anoint my mind and my mouth and my spirit to communicate the Bible in such a way that all will be able to clearly understand. And I thank you that Bible prophecy gives us not only insight as to what is coming next in the world in which we live, it provides us with godly counsel and wisdom on how to navigate the perilous times in which we now live. And there are people from nations around the world, some of which are facing much greater persecution than others. We pray for all of our family, all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, that all of us would remain strong, that none would depart from the faith. And I pray specifically that at the end of our Bible study in the moments to come, I pray for those who may not know where they stand with God, or they're not sure as to whether they're ready to meet the Lord. Some perhaps once knew you, but for various reasons have wandered away. I pray that the love and the conviction of the Holy Spirit would draw men and women and boys and girls to Jesus Christ. And may today be a day of commitment for hundreds and thousands of people. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. In recent days, I don't think you have to be a Christian or even a serious student of the Bible to see that in recent days we are witnessing and watching an aggressive growth in religious pluralism that is advancing the view that all religions are basically equal and there are many paths that lead to God. We've had major leading evangelical voices on major network television who have been interviewed, who when asked, is Jesus Christ the only way to right relationship with God? have said, well, I don't know. I believe there are many paths that lead to God, and I believe all who sincerely seek truth will eventually find it. And this view of religious pluralism 
is sweeping not only the secular world, it has like a cancer infiltrated the modern church and many modern well-known voices in the evangelical community. And this growing trend foreshadows Bible prophecy. The book of Revelation tells us of a coming one world religion where the world is going to bow to the leadership of a charismatic, religious, political, and economic leader that the scripture defines as the Antichrist. Let's address our four questions in our Bible study today. And for those that are taking notes, number one, where does the Bible prophesy a one world religion? In my traveling, in my preaching, and I've had the privilege of preaching around the world, this is a common question when I preach and teach on Bible prophecy and mention that the scripture said there's coming a one world leader, a one world government, a one world religion, a one world monetary system, and a one world military force that will carry out these extreme mandates. And when we ask the question, where in the Bible does it prophesy a one world religion, uh, we go into Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5. The Bible said that the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God. He was given authority to do whatever he wanted to do for 42 months or three and a half years. Now that speaks of the last half of the tribulation. I have much teaching available on the tribulation period taught by both Daniel in the Old Testament, taught by John the Revelator in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. And the Bible is very clear that there is going to be, after the rapture of the church, a seven-year period of time called the tribulation. Many refer to the first three and a half years prophesied by Daniel as the tribulation, and some refer to the last half because of the intensity of the events and the apocalyptic events and the judgment and the wrath of God that will be escalated in that last 42 months as the great tribulation. So if you're a new student of Bible prophecy, just make notes of that. The Bible prophesies a seven-year peace treaty that will be drawn up and signed by that one world leader, the Bible speaks and calls him the Antichrist, he'll sign that peace treaty, most likely in Jerusalem, Israel, and it will be seven years. And there have been multiple attempts in my lifetime, continuing attempts of political leaders traveling to Jerusalem and trying to negotiate peace treaties, even as I speak with the act of terrorism that slaughtered many people in Israel and Benjamin Netanyahu declaring war. And they're in a full-fledged war, Israel wiping out and promising to eliminate all of the terrorism of Hamas and all of their allies. We are watching an incredibly volatile world. And I make no uh, bones about telling you that this one world religion is already on the stage and it is being carried out before our eyes. It's not fully here yet, but I'm going to show you some things in our Bible study today that you're not going to want to miss because they are absolute evidence that you can share with friends or family or people who may not believe that the Bible is believable. These are actual, provable things that show us Bible prophecy being fulfilled. The Bible tells us in verse 6 of Revelation 13 that he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name, his dwelling, those who dwell in heaven, and the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and conquer them. And then it said... He was given authority 
to rule over every tribe, every people, every language, and every nation, and all the people who belong to this world worshipped the beast. And so this coming one world religion is going to have one individual who will be placed in that position of high worship. And the Bible said that the Antichrist will declare himself to be God. And so it's not going to be a one world religion that you recognize today. It may have pieces of religions that you understand today. There may be pieces of Judaism and Islam and Christianity and Catholicism and so on. But make no mistake, the Bible tells us it is not going to be a peaceable world religion. It is going to be mandated and enforced. And all who refuse to worship are going to be murdered and martyred. The author of the book of Revelation left no room for misinterpretation concerning this one world religion that he saw coming. In the original text, he gave five explicit descriptors to ensure that we as readers would have no question as to what he was defining. Those five explicit descriptors he used, he said, every tribe, every people, every language, every nation, and then he went on to say, all the people who belong to this world. So there is no theological gymnastics that you can use to try to pervert that to mean anything else than what it is. I make no bones about it. I put an exclamation upon it again. The Bible prophesied a coming one world religion. We also read in Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 through 18 of a great prostitute or in some Bibles a great harlot that is commonly accepted in sound scholarship to be a metaphor for this false religion that will exist during the tribulation period. That brings us to question number two. What will the one world religion believe? What will be the statement of faith? What will be the core values of this one world religion that the Bible prophesied? In Revelation 17 verses 1 through 18, it gives us several definable characteristics of this coming global religion. In Revelation 17 verses 2 and verse 3, the Bible describes the harlot as committing adultery with the kings of the earth, referring uh, to this false religion's influence among world leaders and political leaders, and it infers that there will probably either be open or veiled sexual perversions. And I, I take no delight in saying this, but we already know that in the political systems of our world, among world revolutionaries, and I'm sure there are exceptions, but the hidden sexual perversions that are a part of global leadership are on display and are becoming more and more known to us and it seems like God is allowing the veil of sexual perversion to be pulled back and many are being exposed. And the Bible tells us this will be a characteristic of these world leaders that will ally themselves to this global religion. In Revelation 17 and 6, the Bible describes the harlot as being drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of those who testify about Jesus. Now, whether they will be martyred at the hand of the Antichrist, and many will. Untold numbers of followers of Christ in the tribulation will be martyred. But some are going to be systematically starved because those who are left behind, let me be clear, don't miss this. As you've heard me teach, 
Uh, and I haven't wavered on this for 45 going on 50 years of preaching and teaching. The next major prophetic event on the calendar of God's eschatology is an event called the rapture of the church. If you're one of our new students, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, the podcast channel, and there are multiple videos on the rapture, the timing of the rapture, false teaching about the rapture, the seven raptures in the Bible, etc., etc. Make note of that, and when you have opportunity, study that. I don't have the time in this Bible study to go down every single road of prophetic material that needs to be addressed. But the next major prophetic event on the calendar of God is the rapture of the church. After the rapture of the church is that seven-year period called the tribulation that will be divided into two equal parts. Three and a half years of peace where the peace treaty drawn up by the Antichrist with Israel is in place and functional. And then at the halfway point, the Antichrist in Revelation 13 betrays that peace treaty, declares himself to be God, commits what is called the abomination of desolation, where he enters into the third temple and declares himself to be God. And at that second half, the power of God's wrath and judgment will be escalated the Bible said that if God had not shortened the time, the second half of the tribulation, if God had not shortened the time, that none would survive. Uh, a vast multitude of the earth's population will be wiped out during that time. I also have a Bible study available that addresses that exactly because the Bible gives us percentages and numbers whereby we know how many people approximately are going to die during the tribulation period. I'm not sure off the top of my head what the title of that is, but I believe that Bible study is called How Many People Will Die During the Tribulation. It's a bloodbath. But the Bible tells us the church, those of us who are believers, those who are alive and those who have already died in faith in the twinkling of an eye by the sounding of a holy trumpet are going to be raptured. That word raptured in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and John 14, we read of being caught up, taken away, and it's sudden and it's quickly in the twinkling of an eye. Those that are alive those who were already in faith in their graves during the church age, church age will be taken. But the Bible said after the rapture, as the tribulation begins, the gospel is still going to be preached. The power of the gospel will be transferred over to the Jewish nation and Jewish believers, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe are going to be preaching. And the gospel is preached in a variety of ways during the tribulation, and many people are going to come to faith. But because they refuse to bow and worship and participate in this one world religion headed up by the Antichrist and the false prophet with Satan behind the scenes puppeting the affairs of the world, the Bible said they'll either be martyred or because they didn't take the mark of the beast, they'll systematically starve to death their families, their children, their babies, their grandchildren. That's why Jesus said, woe unto nursing mothers during this time. It's unimaginable. The horror and the trauma of systematically starving to death, let alone watching your children and your grandchildren and your babies endure that slow, painful death. That's why it's so important to live now, ready to meet the Lord. There's no need for you to experience the tribulation. The Bible is clear that upon the cross, Jesus shed his blood, and the Bible said, He has preserved us from the wrath that is to come. 
In Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, the Bible said, After this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. Revelation tells us that the greatest revival the world has ever witnessed is not going to happen before the rapture. It's going to happen during the tribulation period. I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, martyred, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And then in verses 13 and 14, it tells us who they are. In Revelation 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, Who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are the ones who died in the great tribulation. So don't get confused with that. We have the church age that we're living in now. The church age began at the first advent of Christ. It ends with the second advent of Christ. Jesus prophesied that in Matthew 16 to his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, where he said, I am going to build a church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so the church age that we're living in now has full authority on this earth to carry out the will of Christ in the kingdom of God until the rapture. But after the rapture, all believers in the church age, those that were saved and, and, and died, my brother-in-law just passing days ago, in the last year I have buried my mother and have lost two brother-in-laws. But they were saved during this church age period. And the Bible said that at the rapture, if I'm alive, if you're alive, we'll be taken. But all who were saved in the church age will be taken out of the graves. And the Bible said the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain will be subsequently taken with them to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And thank God for that blessed hope. But make no mistake, all believers or unbelievers, all who do not participate in this one world religion are going to be killed. Revelation 13 verses 16 and 17 tell us, all who refuse to worship the Antichrist by accepting his mark will be unable to buy or sell, thereby making their survival literally impossible. And Revelation 17 and 15, the Bible says it will have a universal mandated authority to carry out those death sentences. They will be murdered. They will be martyred. All who participate will be spared temporarily. But those who are saved during the tribulation are going to pay for their faith in Christ with their very blood. There are several forerunners of this one world religious view that are already in place. Some of you perhaps are hearing about this for the very first time, but there is an organization often referred to as the URI, which stands for the United Religions Initiative. And that was founded recently. As a matter of fact, it was founded in the year 2000. And if you go to their website, they state who they are. And it reads like this. The purpose of the United Religions Initiative is to promote enduring daily interfaith cooperation. Doesn't that sound noble? To promote enduring daily interfaith cooperation to end religiously motivated violence and to create cultures of peace, justice, and healing for the earth and for all living beings. End of quote. It is likely that the false religion of the last days 
will consist of a platform much like this that is inclusive, an inclusive religion that allows for what is called a pluralistic view of God that promotes all religions as one. That brings us to question number three. When will this one world religion emerge? Now there are many people who feel as if that one world religion is already on this earth. I would disagree. I think that the stage is set. I think that it's obvious who the players are. I will be dealing with this on a different level in teachings and Bible studies to come. So be sure to subscribe and every week there's a new Bible study available. Just make a note that I'm going to come back to this and add some layers to the skeleton that we're building upon today because there's much that needs to be said. Are you aware that a one world religion headquarters was officially inaugurated on February 16th, 2023 to provide a global place of worship for all? It's called the Abrahamic Family House and it's funded by the United Arabic Emirates government. It's called the Arabic Family House because Abraham is traditionally considered to be the first Jew and to have made a covenant with God. But Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all recognize and embrace Abraham as their first prophet. And that's why they are called the Abrahamic religions. On their website, they state these words, quote, The Abrahamic family house welcomes people to connect, explore, and reflect. We serve to deepen understanding of our common humanity through mutual dialogue, exchange of knowledge, and the practice of faith. We offer robo robust programs featuring scholars and thought leaders from around the world." End quote. And again, as you read these, it's, it's soothing. It sounds inclusive. It sounds peaceful. It sounds like forward thinking. But what is obviously missing from the URI? What is missing from the Abrahamic family house? What is missing from all of these global entities that are promoting interfaith dialogue? I'll tell you what is missing. You'll never hear John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. You'll never hear Acts chapter 4, verse 12, where the Bible said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The Bible does not allow for interfaith dialogue in the sense of promoting the view that there are multiple paths that eventually all lead to God. It's a political view. It's a world view. It's a secular view. It's being taught on university campuses around the world that all who sincerely seek truth eventually find it. But that makes as much sense as if you were going on a trip to Phoenix, Arizona, and somebody told you it doesn't matter what road you get on, it doesn't matter what direction you go, it doesn't matter whether you head north or south or east or west, all roads eventually lead to Phoenix, Arizona. It's a lie. All roads do not lead to Phoenix, Arizona. There is a particular map system from where you're at in the world that takes you specifically to Phoenix, Arizona. And there is a divine plan set by God that takes you from where you're at today to right relationship with God. And the common denominator in that journey is through the cross of Jesus Christ alone. Jesus didn't say, I am a way among ways. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. 
And no one, no man, no woman, no college student, no young married couple, no teenager, no one can have right relationship with God until they acknowledge the cross of Christ and the shed blood of the spotless Lamb of God who lived, who died, who was buried, who rose again, who promised to return and is coming soon. There is only one path that leads from your sinful state to right relationship with God, and that is through recognizing your sin, repenting of your sin, and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God's only Son. That, my friend, may offend you, but at least you'll not stand before God in Judgment Day and say, no preacher ever loved me enough to open the Bible and just tell me what the Bible said. I am telling you that we are all sinners and there's only one means of salvation and that is through the acknowledging of our sin, the repenting of our sin, and the receiving of the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ the Lord. We're seeing bold and aggressive examples emerging around the world for interfaith dialogue, views that promote the benefits of global religion, and the stage before our eyes is being set. I mentioned the uh, United Religions Ini Initiative. I mentioned the Middle East Global uh, Synagogue and, and, and mosque and, and church built there for all of the world religions, a one world religion place for people to come together. But these are not what we read in Revelation. I repeat, these are not what we read in Revelation. These are players that are setting the stage and conditioning minds to be ready to move when the Antichrist arrives. The specific one world religion of the end times cannot listen, cannot come into existence until the tribulation begins and until the Antichrist breaks his peace treaty with Israel. Lastly, and I close with this, who will lead this one world religion? Revelation 13 tells us that this one world religion, uh, one world government, one world monetary system, one world military force, with the one world leader who is the Antichrist, will himself, as an ally of the unholy trinity, and if you've not heard our teaching on the unholy trinity, Revelation 13 is the very first place in the Bible in prophecy where we read about the unholy trinity. Who are the members of the unholy trinity? Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. These are clearly uh, unveiled for us. And again, for the very first time in Revelation chapter 13. And so in that final book of the Bible, a book of prophecy, this one world religion, will have three parts. Uh, the power behind the scenes is Satan himself. The Bible calls him the dragon. The Bible in Revelation tells us the dragon is Satan. We don't have to wonder what was meant by that. As you read other passages, the Bible literally tells us the dragon is Satan. The Antichrist will be the one world leader and the false prophet will work with him as a vice president, so to speak, or an executive system. He will prop up and lead the way and enforce various mandates on behalf of the Antichrist. So who will lead this one world religion? Revelation 13 verses 11 through 18 tell us that it is the Antichrist. And the Bible tells us that that day is just around the corner. The URI, United Religions Initiative, founded when? 2000. The Abrahamic Family House, founded and inaugurated when? 
2023, just months ago. And I could go down a long list. I could talk to you about the Catholic Church. I could talk to you about Pope Francis and multiple religious voices in the world who carry great weight and authority who have all come together and said it's time for us to put away all of our religious doctrine that separates us and we must begin to meet at the table of interfaith dialogue. You'll see that on most of their websites in many of their speeches. I've repeated it several times in our Bible study today purposefully to seed it into your mind. When you start hearing about interfaith dialogue, when you start hearing about religious community, you need to pay attention. But here's the good news, and I close with this. This all takes place when? It takes place in the tribulation. We know specifically when. When the Antichrist signs that peace treaty in Jerusalem, three and a half years to the day after the Antichrist signs that peace treaty in Israel, that's when the official inauguration of the coming one world religion will launch. And when it does, God have mercy on those that are left behind. Because the launching of this one world religion, where the Antichrist desecrates the Holy of Holies, and by the way, it's not going to happen in Abu Dhabi, where the Abrahamic family house is. It's not going to happen at the headquarters of the United Nations or the URI or, or in Rome. It's going to happen in Jerusalem, Israel, and he will desecrate the third temple, set himself up as God, and in that moment, simultaneously, don't miss this, simultaneously as he declares himself to be God, the true God of heaven and earth will turn up the power of wrath and judgment like the world has never seen. Are you living ready to meet the Lord? Now again, you've heard me say it multiple times, Bible prophecy is not given to scare us. Bible prophecy is given to prepare us. If you're wise, you'll not be here for the tribulation. If you're wise, you'll not be here for the announcement of that one world religion. If you're wise, you'll not be here for that one world economic system and the mark of the beast. You'll not be here if you're wise. What do you mean, Tiff, if I'm wise? If you're wise, you'll receive Christ now and live ready to meet him every single day. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Do you have a clear distinct memory of a time in your life when you've prayed what many people call the sinner's prayer and in your own heart made a sincere commitment to repent of sin and to receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I'd like to pray with you. Will you allow me that privilege today? Some of you that will pray with me maybe don't have a specific memory of a time in your life when you've made peace with God. There are hundreds and thousands of others who have prayed with us through these various broadcasts who have mentioned that there once was a time when you knew the Lord, but for whatever reason, and there are multitudes of reasons why, people have wandered away. And when you pray with me, all who are watching on our YouTube channel specifically, will you let me know in the comments? Just let me know. Say, Tiff, I prayed that prayer with you. I was sincere. And we want to continue to pray for you. Anything we can do at Lost Lamb, it's on the screen, lostlamb.org. This ministry exists to help you not only find faith in Christ, but it exists to help you grow in your faith to stay rooted in your faith, and to live ready to meet the Lord. Wherever you're at, pray with me right now from your heart. God hears every word. The Bible said, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, 
you were teaching me and speaking to me. And down deep in my heart, I want to live ready in these last days. I want to live ready to meet the Lord. And so today, in humility, I recognize my sin. I repent of my sin in childlike faith. I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. And I ask you to come into my heart right now. Be my Lord and my Savior. I vow this day I will serve the Lord all the days of my life place of my weakness. Give me your strength and keep me ready for your soon return. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.